joy unspeakable by Martin Lloyd-Jones The Baptism and Gifts of the Holy Spirit Chapter 1 Baptism with the Spirit and Regeneration The words to which I should like to call your attention are to be found in John chapter 1 in verse 26 to 33. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you know not, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. I take these two verses and put them together because of this great truth which they bring out, namely that John the Baptist was constantly telling the people that he was not the Christ, and that the essential difference between them was that he baptized with water, whereas the Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now why are we looking at this? Well, we are doing so because the statement in John 1.16 shows us that the truth about the Christian should be this statement of John 1.16, quote, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for or upon grace. That is what the Christian is meant to be like. He is a man who has received something of the fullness of Christ, and he goes on receiving it increasingly. That is the Christian life, and I am suggesting that John, the evangelist, shows us that the way in which this can be become true of us, and increasingly true of us, is that we receive of his fullness in large and great measure when we are truly baptized with the Holy Spirit by the Lord Jesus Christ. John the, ba the Baptist himself drew this contrast clearly in his ministry. When we read Luke 3, 1-17, we see some of the striking contrast between John's baptism and our Lord's baptism. Putting it very roughly, we see the difference between religion and Christianity. Or indeed, we can go further, the difference between being content with only the beginnings or, quote, first principles, see Hebrews 6, verse 1, of the doctrine of Christ in the same doctrine in greater fullness. Now we are doing this, and I must go on repeating it, because this is no academic exercise. Indeed, it seems to me that this is the thing we need above all else at the present time. We need it as individual Christians, but we need it still more because of the state of the world that is round and about us. If we have no sense of responsibility for the condition of humanity at this moment, then there is only one thing to say. If we are Christians at all, we are very poor ones. If we are only concerned about ourselves and our own happiness, and if the moral condition of society and the tragedy of the whole world does not grieve us, if we are not disturbed at the way in which men blaspheme the name of God and all the arrogance of sin, well, what can be said about us? But I am, I am assuming that we are concerned, and that we are concerned for ourselves, that we may receive what God has intended us to receive in his Son. Quote, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. End quote. And if we are not receiving what he has made possible, it is an insult to God. So these two aspects must be borne in mind, our own individual states and needs, but still more, the condition of the world around us. That that, then, is what we are doing, and I am trying to show that the great and constant danger is that we should be content with something which is altogether less than that intended for us. Let me put it like this. Perhaps the greatest danger of all for Christian people is the danger of understanding the scriptures in the light of their own experiences. We should not interpret scripture in the light of our experiences, but we should examine our experiences in the light of the teaching of the scripture. 
this is a fundamental and basic point, which is particularly important just at this moment in view of the things that are happening in the Christian church. There are two main ways in which, it seems to me, we can go wrong in this question of the relationship of our experiences to the teaching of Scripture. The first danger is that of claiming things which either go beyond the Scripture or which, indeed, may even be contrary to it. Now, there are many who have done that throughout the centuries, and there are people who are still doing it. There have been people, they, are, they were to be found in the early church, who have claimed that they were uniquely inspired. The, the apostle calls them false apostles. And there were people who claimed that they were receiving revelation who did not care what the teaching was. They said they were directly inspired by God. I remember once hearing a man saying he did not care what the Apostle Paul or anybody else said. He knew he had had an experience. Now the moment a man says that, he is putting his own experience above the scriptures. That opens the door to fanaticism, not enthusiasm, but fanaticism and other possible dangers. So there is one danger that we put what we experience subjectively over the scripture. Another way in which this is done is to put tradition or the teaching of the church above scripture. This has been the Roman Catholic heresy. It says that tradition is coordinate with the scripture. And that means in the end that tradition is superior to the scripture. There is nothing in the scripture about the so-called assumption of the Virgin Mary Virgin Mary, a doctrine which says that she never died and was buried, but literally rose in the body into heaven. But they teach it, and it is their authority alone that sanctions such a teaching. That is the kind of thing I mean. But forgetting something as obvious as the Roman Catholic heresy, there are many, and they are generally the most spiritually minded, who are always prone to become so interested in the experimental side that they become indifferent to the scripture. The early Quakers were particularly subject to this with their emphasis on the inner light. They too said that whatever the scripture may say, they knew a doctrine had been revealed to them directly. One of them, poor man, claimed that he was the incarnate Christ again and rode into the city of Bristol on a horse with many misguided people following him who believed his teaching because he spoke to them with authority. Now that is fanaticism, and it is a terrible danger which we must always bear in mind. It arises from a divorce between scripture and experience, where we put experience above scripture, claiming things that are not sanctioned by scripture, or are perhaps even prohibited by it. But there is a second danger, and it is equally important that we should bear it in mind. The second is the exact opposite of the first, as these things generally go from one violent extreme to the other. How difficult it, it always is to maintain a balance. The second danger, then, is that of being satisfied with something very much less than what is offered in the scripture, and the danger of interpreting scripture by our experiences and reducing its teaching to the level of what we know and experience. And I would say that this second is the greater danger of the two at the present time. In other words, certain people by nature are afraid of the supernatural, of the unusual, of disorder. You can be so afraid of disorder, so concerned about discipline and de decorum and control, that you become guilty of what the scripture calls quote, quenching the spirit. And there is no question in my mind that there has been a great deal of this. <clears throat> People come to the New Testament and instead of taking its teaching as it is, they interpret it in the light of their experience and so they reduce it. Everything is interpreted in terms of what they have and what they experience. And I believe that this is very largely largely responsible 
for the condition of the Christian church at this present time. People are so afraid of what they call enthusiasm, and some are so afraid of fanaticism, that in order to, co to avoid those, they go right over to the other side without facing what is offered in the New Testament. They take what they have and what they are as the norm. Let me just put it in a nutshell in this way. Compare, for instance, what you read about the life of the church at Corinth with typical church life today. Ah, but you say, they were guilty of excesses in Corinth. I quite agree. But how many churches do you know at the present time to which it is necessary to write such a letter as the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Do not put your emphasis entirely on the excesses. Paul corrects the excesses, but we see what he allows, what he expects. Take your New Testament as it is. Look at the New Testament Christian. Look at the New Testament church, and you see it vibrant with a spiritual life, and, of course, it is always life that tends to lead to excesses. There is no problem of discipline in a graveyard. There is no problem very much in a formal church. The problems arise when there is life. A poor sickly child is not difficult to handle, but when that child is well and full of life and vigor, well, then you have your problems. Problems are created by life and by vigor and the problems of the early church were spiritual problems, problems arising because of the danger of going to excess in the spiritual realm. Would anybody like to claim that speaking generally, that is the danger in the church today? Well, it is not, of course, and the reason is that we have been tending to interpret the New Testament teaching in the light of our own experiences. These, then, are the two great dangers, which are both wrong and both equally wrong. The excesses, of course, and the fanaticism are most spectacular and they always attract attention, but the other is equally bad, if not more so. There is all the difference in the world between a man in a state of delirium when he is ill and a man suffering from some terrible growth which is just eating out the vitals of his life and of his body, reducing him more or less to a state of paralysis and of helplessness. But the two things are equally bad, and therefore we have to remember them both. And so, as we handle this whole matter, I would lay down this fundamental proposition that everything must be tested by the teaching of Scripture. We must not start with what we think, what we like. Some of us would like the the spectacular. Others are so dignified that dignity is the one thing that matters. Everything must be ordered and dignified and orderly, working like a clock with all the mechanism and me mechanis mechanistic characteristics of a clock or of a machine. So if we start with ourselves and what we like in our experience, we will already go wrong. No, we have got to start, all of us, with the New Testament and its teaching. Now, fortunately, for us, there is plenty of it. If we look at two incidences, incidents in Acts, the end of chapter 18 and the beginning of chapter 19, the case of Apollos and the case of the disciples whom Paul found at Ephesus, we discover the following things. There are obviously steps or stages in the Christian life. The New Testament is full of that, quote, babes in Christ, quote, young men, old men, growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, and so on. But not only that, this is more than supported and fulfilled and substantiated in the subs subsequent history of men in the long story of the Christian church. And we see, especially in those two instances to which I have referred, that what really makes the difference is this baptism of the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit or this quote receiving of the Spirit. Let me try to put this teaching of the New Testament as I understand it in the form of a number of principles. 
We must do this because John tells us at the beginning of his gospel that the thing that is going to differentiate the new era from the old, even including John the Baptist, is this baptism with the Spirit. Here is the first principle. It is possible for us to be believers in the Lord Jesus Christ without having, without having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But let me clarify this, because it is often misunderstood, and this to me is the crux of the whole interpretation of the New Testament at this point. It is the key point. Do not start thinking about phenomena. I will come to that later. That is the fatal mistake that people make. They start with phenomena. They have their prejudices and they take up their lines and their points and the New Testament teaching is entirely forgotten. No, we must start with the teaching of the scripture. How? Well, in this way, it is obvious that no man can be a Christian at all apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. The natural man, the natural mind, we are told, is, quote, enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, end quote. The Apostle Paul in that whole passage in Romans 8, 7, which I have just quoted, draws his great distinction between the natural man and the spiritual man, and that is the great difference. The spiritual man is a man, he says, who is, quote, led by the Spirit, end quote and who walks after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Basically, therefore, you have to start by saying that no man can be a Christian at all without the Holy Spirit. The natural mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Again, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul puts it this way, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. In that chapter, too, the Apostle is drawing a distinction between the Christian and the non-Christian. He says, Even the princes of this world, though they are great men in great positions, and men of great ability, are not Christians. Why? Well, they have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Quote, Had they known him, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. End quote. How then do we believe? How does anybody believe in him? Well, he says, God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And again, he says, We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says we are Christians because the Holy Spirit has worked in us and has given us this enlightenment in knowledge and understanding, this ability to believe. A man cannot believe without the work of the Holy Spirit. In every believer, the Holy Spirit is of necessity a resident. That is a fundamental statement of the whole of Scripture. It is the Spirit who convicts us and who gives us the enlightenment and the ability to believe. No man by nature can believe the gospel. This is fundamental right through the whole Bible. But then we can go further. It is the Holy Spirit who regenerates us. It is he who gives us new life. The Christian is a man who is born again. Yes, he is a man who is born of the Spirit. Now in the Gospel of John, as we shall find, there is great teaching about this. You get it at once in our Lord's teaching to Nicodemus of all men. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 5 That is it. This is something that happens as the result of the operation of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. It is a secret work of the Spirit. It is not something exper- experimental, but it is but it is a secret work, and a man only knows that it has happened to him. But we have got a very specific statement in Romans 8, 9, 
which puts this matter quite tersely once and forever. <clears throat> Paul says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So that, clearly, any man who is a Christian is a man in whom the Holy Spirit of God dwells. I take it that that is therefore abundantly clear. You cannot be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit in you. But, and here is the point, I am asserting at the same time that you can be a believer, that you can have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, and still not be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now this is the crucial issue. Why do I say this? Let me give you my reasons. All I have been describing is the work of the Holy Spirit in us, the work of convicting, the work of enlightening, the work of regenerating, and so on. That is what the Holy Spirit does in us. But as you notice in the teaching in the first chapter of John's Gospel, in which we see so clearly in the preaching of John the Baptist, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that is done by the Lord Jesus Christ, not by the, not by the Holy Spirit. I indeed baptize you with water, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. This is not primarily some work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Lord Jesus, it is the Lord Jesus Christ's act. It is his action, something he does to us through the Spirit, or his giving to us in this particular way of the Spirit. Now here, it seems to me, is something that is there, plain and clear on the very surface of this whole subject, and yet people get confused over it. And quote 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized. End quote. Of course we are. Our being baptized into the body of Christ is the work of the Spirit, as regeneration is his work, but this is something entirely different. This is Christ baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. And I am suggesting that this is something which is therefore obviously distinct from and separate from becoming a Christian, being regenerate, having the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. I am putting it like this. You can be a child of God and yet not be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you some proof. I start with the Old Testament saints. They were as much the children of God as you and I are. Abraham is the father of the faithful, a child of God. Now I could give you endless scriptures to prove that. Our Lord himself says, You shall sit in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And yet some of these Jews are going to be outside, though they kept on boasting that Abraham was their father. But that is what it means to be in the kingdom of God, to be with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul in Galatians 3 shows at great length that all the children of faith are children of Abraham. He is the father of the faithful. Indeed, the Apostle Paul, as the Apostle to the Gentiles, goes out of his way to emphasize this great thing, that when the Gentiles became Christians, what happened to them was that they became, quote, fellow citizens with the saints, end quote. That is to say, the saints of the Old Testament and joint heirs with the saints of the Old Testament. You remember also that great contrast in Ephesians 2 verse 11 and following. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, which are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise. That is where, where they are. That is where they were. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, all these men of the Old Testament, they all belong to the household of God. And when we become Christians, as Gentiles, we become fellow citizens with them and members of the household of God. And then, 
to make this thing abundantly clear, the Apostle repeats it in Ephesians 3. He says that the revelation had been made known to him of the mystery. What is it? Well, here it is, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the, by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ. If you think that the Old Testament saints were not children of God, you are denying the whole of the Scripture. They were, but they had not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Abraham believed in Christ. Our Lord says, Abraham saw my day. He saw it afar off, and he rejoiced. These men did not understand it fully, but what made them children of God and men of faith was this, that they believed God's testimony about this coming one. No man can be saved except in Christ. There is only one way of salvation, Old Testament and New. It is always in Christ and by him crucified. But what about John the Baptist himself? Our Lord makes this quite clear. He says, Among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a son of God. He is a child of God. And yet John was not baptized with the Holy Spirit. Notwithstanding, says our Lord, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Matthew 11, verse 11. That is a reference to the kingdom of heaven taking the form of the church. That though John the Baptist is the last of the prophets, though he is a child of God and a unique servant of God, though the man is as saved as any Christian, he is not enjoying the benefits which those who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which Christ is to give, are able to enjoy. And then you remember that most important statement in John 7, 37-39, quote, In the last day, thy great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, but they that believe on him should receive which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet, the authorized version adds, given, quite rightly, was not yet given, was not yet, had not come in that way yet. The Holy Spirit always was, of course. You read about him in the Old Testament, but he was not given in this way yet. He was given like that on the day of Pentecost, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now there again is one of the crucial statements, but let us go on and add to that. All this, it seems to me, becomes much clearer when you come right on to Acts and look at the case of the apostles themselves. Now surely it is quite obvious that the apostles were regenerate and were children of God before the day of Pentecost. Our Lord has already said, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you, John 15, 3. In the great high priestly prayer in John 17, he keeps on drawing a distinction between them and the world. I quote, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Throughout the whole of that seventeenth chapter, the emphasis is that these people are already regenerate. Our Lord keeps on saying that. He says, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me nothing could be clearer. And then we are told that after the resurrection, our Lord met with them in an upper room, and he, quote, breathed on them. He breathed on them the Holy Spirit. You remember that incident. It is recorded in John 20. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. 
as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. These men are not only believers, they are regenerate men. The Holy Spirit has been breathed upon them, yet they have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 4-8 makes this very clear. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, here it is again, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be, my, be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And these selfsame men, already believers and regenerate, already having received the Holy Spirit in one sense, were, quote, baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is my way of substantiating that a man can be a true believer on the Lord Jesus Christ and a child of God, and still not baptized with the Holy Spirit. But come, let us go on to the evidence which we have already seen in Acts 8, where it is perhaps still more clearly put before us. Philip went down from Jerusalem to Samaria to preach the gospel to those Samaritans. And we are told this, The people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And there was great joy in that city. This is followed by the incident about Simon. But let us concentrate on these others. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Now this is not the teaching of John the Baptist. This is the teaching of Philip, filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost, the plain Christian teaching. Quote, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. End quote. Here they are then, believers, and they are rejoicing in their belief. They have been baptized not with John's baptism, but they have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But then comes verse 14. Now when the, when the apostles were which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Parentheses, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. End parentheses. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. These people were already true believers on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him crucified as their Savior. They had been baptized into His name because they had become believers. But still, they were not baptized with the Holy Spirit. The next case we must consider is none other than that of the Apostle Paul himself. We are, at this point, let me remind you, just going through the scriptures. Later we shall be drawing lessons and working this out in detail. It is so vital that we should start with the scriptures, not with our prejudices, not with what we think, not what we are afraid of. Ah, you may say, now you have said that tongues are all right. I am sure many are already thinking that. You wait a minute, I shall deal with the question of gifts when it comes at the right place. You do not start with that that comes towards the end of this treatment, but that is how the devil gets us to bypass the scriptures in the interests of our, of our particular point of view, whichever of the two extremes it may chance to be. Look then 
at the case of Paul himself. You get that in Acts 9. There, on the road to Damascus, he sees the risen Lord and says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He becomes as helpless as a little child. Undoubtedly, the apostle at that point believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw it. He was given the vision that enabled him to see it. But this is what I read in verses 10 and 11. A man named Ananias was called by the Lord, and the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For, behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Paul was rendered blind, you remember. Then you go on in verse 15, The Lord said unto him, Ananias did not seem to want to go. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles, and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He does not instruct him on the way of salvation. He is sent to heal him and to fill him with the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> to give him the baptism of, with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. You can, you see, receive the Holy Spirit before you are baptized, or the other way around. It does not matter at all. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. There, then, is another striking example of the same thing. I come now to my last example from Acts. I am not going to use the case of Apollos, though I believe it could be used quite easily. It seems to me that this is the only adequate explanation of the story about him. This was the thing that Priscilla and Aquila recognized as lacking in Apollos, and about which they told him, and it made all the difference to him. But leaving that out of account, Come to the beginning of chapter 19, where you read, It came to pass that, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples. And you remember that we have seen the full connotation of that. For in Acts, without a single exception, it always means believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? All right, I know what you want to say, and you are quite right. You say you are reading from the authorized version. I am. You say that is not the right translation. I agree, so let me give, you, give it to you in the revised and the other translations. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Right, that is the correct translation. And of course, it shows that the old authorized translation is, after all, not wrong. Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? My italics. The implication there, obviously, is, of course, that you can believe without receiving the Holy Spirit, that it happens to you afterwards. All right, you say, but the other is the correct translation. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? But what does that tell us? Well, that too tells us that it is obvious that you can believe without receiving the Holy Spirit. Let me use an illustration which I think I have used before. You may say to me, I had a cold last week. I then put, it, put to you this one question. Did you run a temperature when you had your cold last week? 
What does that question mean? Well, it obviously means that you may have a cold without running a temperature. On the other hand, you may run a temperature when you have a cold. I want to know, did you or did you not have one? And that is the very question that is put here by the Apostle. It is possible for a man to be baptized with the Holy Spirit virtually simultaneously with his belief. Take the case of Cornelius in his household. You remember that there, there we are told in Acts 10 that as Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. There it seems that the baptism with the Holy Spirit happened as they were believing, almost simultaneously. But it is clear from the question put by the Apostle that that is not always the case, that it is possible for a man to believe without receiving the Holy Spirit. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believed? Paul, obviously, saw that there was something wrong with these people, and he was quite clearly of the opinion himself that they had not been baptized with the Holy Ghost. So he puts forth, he puts his question, quote, when you believed, were you baptized with the Holy Spirit? So you see, even the Revised Translation and the others come to exactly the same thing in the end as the old authorized version, except that these others are more accurate. From the purely linguistic standpoint, the authorized translation is wrong, but as so often, these authorized translators get the right point, the right meaning, but they overemphasize it a little so that it looks as if it is always something subsequent. But what is established beyond any doubt is that one can be a believer without being baptized by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but if that does not satisfy you, and it should, pay attention to this. In Acts 19.4, Paul addresses these men and gives them further instruction, and then we read, quote, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle is perfectly happy that these men are true believers, but they have had John's baptism only, so he says. But you must be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he baptized them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are true believers, children of God, but still they have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Because we read in verse 6, When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now there is an absolute proof that you can be a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and still not be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That incident proves it twice over. Twice over. The question at the beginning and what actually happened subsequently the important point is that there is a difference, that there is a distinction between believing and being baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I give you my last bit of evidence, which is in Ephesians 1.13. Paul is here reminding these Gentile Christians of how they became Christians, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. <clears throat> All right, you say again, authorized version once more, and again they have made exactly the same mistake, in whom also after that ye believed. It should not be that. What should it be? Well, as the Revised has it, in whom, having also believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit. But ye see once more that it does not make any difference to the meaning and to the truth. It is only the believer who is baptized with the Holy Spirit, or receives the seal of the Spirit, in whom, having believed, were sealed. It is the same order again. The believing is the first thing. But being baptized is something that does not of necessity happen at the same time. It may, it may not, but it is distinct and separate. So the apostle does separate them, in whom, having also believed, ye were sealed with that, 
with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That then is our first great principle. All I am trying to establish is this, that you can be regenerate without being baptized with the Holy Spirit. The scriptures that I have adduced to you show quite clearly that that to say, as so many have said and are still saying, that every man at regeneration is of necessity baptized with the Holy Spirit is simply to fly in the face of, it, of this plain, explicit teaching of the Holy Scriptures.